to the Strong Mom channel. Today we're talking about the actual how-tos of preparing your body and vagina to push out a baby. Before we dive into these important questions um, that I know you guys have asked me, we're interviewing Anita Lambert. She is the owner of Holistic Health Physiotherapy. She is the creator of the Bump to Birth Method and co-host of the To Birth and Beyond podcast. She's a mom of two, a perinatal pelvic health physiotherapist with a focus on prenatal and postpartum care. She's also a physio doula, so she brings all of the doula to her work as well. She's passionate about helping you connect with your body, including your pelvic floor, plus keeping you active and comfortable during pregnancy while you prepare for birth and helping you to navigate your postpartum recovery and return to exercise without pain or pelvic floor symptoms. No one can guarantee how your birth will go. However, having worked with hundreds of pregnant moms and postpartum clients um, in her physiotherapy practice, she plus going through her own experiences, she sees how working together with your body rather than ignoring it benefits not only you in pregnancy, but also during birth and in postpartum recovery. And this is why she opened her holistic health physiotherapy clinic and uh, she practices out of Peterborough, Ontario. So welcome, Anita. I'm so glad you're here. And um, you have so much awesome uh, Instagram that I thought, you know, and, and, and YouTube, you have some great uh, resources on YouTube that I use in my own clients who are pregnant. So I thought we need to interview you because I know that so many moms um, just show up at the hospital and like, yeah, I'm ready to give birth. Okay, without even having thought or planned how is this actually going to happen? You know, my daughter is eight years old and we just started talking about where babies come from. And she's like, uh, really? They come from there. So, right. We, th this is really important. We need to actually, we always say that, um, birth is a marathon and we need to train for that marathon. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we don't want you to be surprised. We don't want you to be tense. We want you to be prepared. And that's what we're diving into today to today. So welcome, Anita. Thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today. Um, and the, the first question, this is going to be like, we've got a lot. Um, yeah. How, like, where do you even start? So how do you actually prepare your pelvic floor in pregnancy to push out a baby? And why is it not just about Kegel? Yeah, well, thank you for having me, Denise. I'm so excited to chat with you and your audience as well. Yeah, so it is, it's a big question. It's like, where do we start, right? Because so many people are just given this blanket statement of go do Kegels and then people kind of go, what does that even mean? And you start to Google and then there's this whole rabbit hole you go down and it's not always up to date or evidence-based. So I think it is helpful to even know I've got my pelvic floor model oh, um, yes. yeah to even know like what is our pelvic floor because yes. that'll give you insight specifically because pushing um there's kind of a focus we want to know how to relax the pelvic floor almost think of like we want to open the door for a baby mm -hmm. to come out but within pregnancy we do want to know how to contract and relax and I think where the whole kegel narrative comes in is when people get told to do Kegels, they're just told to like clench and hold these muscles, which that in itself doesn't necessarily do us much good. So let's even kind of briefly just even go over what the muscles are so people know. So right. the muscles attach from your pubic bone to your sit bones, to your tailbone. So that whole red area, which is really surprising, is actually our pelvic floor. So there's the front and the back. And people are surprised, anything to do with bowel movements, gas, tailbone pain, all of that is actually related to the pelvic floor as well. And then internally attaches from your pubic bone again to your tailbone and really pretty far side to side. A lot of people think, because when we Google it, people are told, okay, stop P. So we think, so this is your, your urethra where P comes out of. We just picture there are these little tiny muscles here, but actually it's that whole area. These muscles help us not leak pee, stool gas, they support our pelvic organs, they, they support our baby when we're pregnant, our back, our sacrum, our hips, um, so many, so many key roles. So to give everyone an idea what the pelvic floor is, 
Now, how I was saying, it is important to learn how to contract and relax. And you'll hear different terms. What term do you use, Denise, for that? Because I call it um, core breath or core canister breath. Do you specifically use a yeah, wording I, versus Kegels? Yeah, I say core yeah. breath core or breath. Yeah. the blueberry visualization yes. I do a lot. Yeah. Totally. So that idea, right? So your audience is familiar with that. So that idea we want to squeeze and lift and relax these muscles. Right. And when it comes to pushing and labor in general, we want to know how to more focus on that lowering of the, the blueberries, or we'll talk about the flower bloom cue. I know that you love to use with your um, yes. clients as well, focusing on that relaxation. Um, because like I said, when baby is exiting there, the last thing we want to do is be, if we're fighting a contraction or tensing, we're going against the opposite direction we want in terms of the pelvic floor to help give space for baby. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's kind of the difference, but also to know too, our pelvic floor, how you use the term, the core breath as well, like how it's related to our diaphragm. And this comes into pushing as well. So this idea, if your diaphragm under your ribs, you got your pelvic floor, when we breathe in, they relax. When we breathe out, they lift. So that whole, I, that connection. Right. But when it comes to pushing, we'll talk about that inhale to relax. And as you exhale, thinking of it staying relaxed versus that extra lift with it. But I'm the same. I use core canister breath or core breath instead of Kegel when it comes to knowing how to contract. Um, and relax with it. Right. So we do need mm -hmm. a strong pelvic floor mm -hmm. in pregnancy mm -hmm. um, and, and in postpartum. So it is important to be strengthening your pelvic floor. And yeah. at what point do, I mean, yes, you need it to be uh, strong and strengthened, but we also do need to work on relaxation. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big one because uh, most of us who hear Kegels, our OBs, doctors, midwives have said do Kegels. Mm -hmm. But there's no real focus on explaining how to do them, right? Yes. So that's yes. where that core breath comes in, but also relaxing. And I find myself type A, I'm, I know I'm a hypertonic person. So, re, right, kind of always like yeah. having them, the, the muscles more tight than they need to be. Um, so let's go into how to relax mm -hmm. our pelvic floor um for pregnant women for for pregnant women and uh how this is going to help them uh, birth the baby or i like to say breathe your baby out because yeah. i i and i can't tell you how important having a doula was for me in my two births mm -hmm. because um not that i know you have your course but the course that mm -hmm. i did was uh hypnobirthing and mm -hmm. totally just help you kind of zone into how to breathe and how important breathing is in that uh, labor process. Totally. And yeah, I did have no birth going into my first birth. I was already in the perinatal wor world in terms of pelvic health and being a physio, but I took all these courses because a, I'm like, what could I learn more about? And B, I wanted to see what my clients were learning. So have no birthing. I thought was great too, with the, the affirmations, meditations, the breathing. Um, and then when it comes to the pelvic floor, so the cueing that I like to use is what we call the flower bloom breath. So that idea, again, going back to that diaphragm with the pelvic floor, when we breathe in, basically you're picturing like a flower bloom out of the vaginal opening. So inhale bloom, as you exhale, you're thinking of it staying open. And I find this really helps people connect for whatever that image, the pelvic floor in the brain, it just really connects well so that you open and then it stays open and then you inhale open another flower, thinking of it open, exhale, it stays open. Now it can feel challenging because so many people are used to getting feedback. So when you do the core breath, you feel the squeeze and lift, and then you feel the lowering because it's been lifted. But this whole idea of relaxing and staying relaxed, we don't get the same feedback. So some people think like, I don't think I'm doing anything. Am I doing it right? Um, as a pelvic physio, I can actually assess internally and give feedback that way. But for a lot of people, I tell them like, if you're, if you're not feeling the clench happening, you're probably doing it well. Like you shouldn't feel a ton happening. And then also the opposite. You shouldn't think of like pushing the flower out. That's another thing. Some of my clients do. They're like, I want to feel something. So I would like try to bear down and push it out. Right. That's not necessarily what we want either. So you won't get a ton of feedback. 
but that's not a bad thing. Right. Um, and when we talk about perineal massage a little later, um, that's what I cue my clients to use. And in the bump to birth method is I'll say, use the flower bloom you've been practicing while you do perineal massage. So then you're really connecting the brain with the pelvic floor of how to relax, especially when there is some discomfort, like when baby is crowning, if you've practiced how to lengthen, how to connect to relax versus tense up against that sensation, super, super helpful, um, especially around pushing. Right. Okay. So let's do that because yeah. most people who are watching this moms will probably know how to do your Kegel exhale, pick it up. And then you inhale, relax, right? Exhale, pick up. Okay. So here's what I want you to do. Ladies who are watching, I want you. Yes. Exhale, pick up. I want you to inhale, relax. I want you to exhale, keep relaxing. So that flower keep relaxing, keep relaxing as you exhale, keep relaxing as you inhale. So fully relaxing the mm -hmm. pelvic floor as you inhale and as you exhale. So that's what Anita's talking about in her mm -hmm. flower bloom breath. I'm actually going to link your uh, quick YouTube video too, yeah. because the way that you say it is so relaxing. <laughs> and I forget, well, I don't know, if you, maybe it's just your fingers. I forget what visual yeah. you, you give, but I give this yeah. to a lot of my clients because just the way that you explain it, the softness mm -hmm. of your voice is just so perfect uh, for my clients in going through this. So um, that's uh, how you will be doing that and breathing for uh, birth as well. Totally. Um, so can you give us because, you know, you've just talked about, you know, flower bloom breath, but what are some relaxing um, uh, pelvic floor, I guess, positions that we can mm -hmm. be in as well? Totally. So I like to pair the flower bloom with postures and often a lot of prenatal yoga postures are amazing. So um, some are stationary. So potentially malasana, like that deep squat, you may want to be supported um, by some yoga blocks, but that deep squat and doing your bloom there is great. Or yes, using... I do this one against the wall. So yeah, I get moms to that's great. do it against the wall, get nice and low in that squat. Yes, that's a yeah. great one. Yeah, I love that one. And then you can also do it with uh, dynamic movement. So cat cow is an awesome one to do it with. Um, any of those where you're opening the kind of thinking basically, because with cat cow, essentially your pelvis is doing a pelvic tilt. And so it's a great way to add that bloom kind of behind you. Mm -hmm. um, child's pose is another fantastic one. And then also if you're in your third trimester, you know, use it with labor positions that you're learning. So then even better when you're in labor, we don't know what your body's going to gravitate to. So practice a variety of them. But if you practice um, doing that bloom in various positions, again, that's going to connect even more once you're in labor. Exactly. Um, yeah. And even another way I tell, do it with bowel movements. When you're in the bathroom, going to the bathroom, it's a great time to practice the flower bloom because essentially when you go pee or poop, you want to be relaxing the pelvic floor. So right. great time to practice rather than straining. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good yeah. one. And using the birthing ball, I'm sure you use that a lot in your yeah. course uh, with your clients as well. So mm -hmm. yes, definitely getting you to practice all of these things. So mm -hmm. speaking about practice um, and, um, you know, getting your vagina ready and you had, mm -hmm. a, you know, just mentioned this before, a uh, perineal massage. So can mm -hmm. you tell us what perineal massage is? Um, uh, because I know when I speak and I recommend that my clients do, they're like, I have never heard of that. Yeah. So <laughs> totally. let's get into that because I think it's so important. And, um, I did this with both my first and, and second baby, and it, it definitely helped with learning how to cope with the sensations down there, as well as how to tap into that breathing. So tell us all yeah. about perineal massage. Totally. So perineal massage, typically you do it later on. So 34, 35 ish weeks. Um, oftentimes, even a few times a week, you do not need to do it every day. Um, there's different ways you can do it. Some people feel they can reach this area. I couldn't do, do it. it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't either at that point. So some options, if you can't, um, you could have your partner do it. So that's what I always talk to clients about, educate their partner. You, there's different tools. So the Kegel release curve is a great, it's kind of like an S shaped um, tool that you can use. So then you can do it yourself and it's easier to reach. So there's options. Um, 
And the most recent research um, showed it can decrease the risk of severe tears, episiotomies, as well as shorten the second stage of labor, so the pushing stage, which is great, um, but also help decrease the risk of uh, postpartum perineum pain, so pain in this area after baby comes, and decrease the risk of fecal incontinence, so that's leaking stool after, oh, okay. so tons of benefits. Mm -hmm. um, but with that being said, I do, like, I think anything to do with preparation, people should be given information, and they get to decide if they feel like, yes, this is the right fit, I can do this. Um, because I want people to know too, if you don't do perineal massage, it doesn't mean you are going to tear and you are gonna have episiotomy. It's just that it decreases your risk, which is, which is great. Um, so with perineal massage, I'll kind of show you here. Um, let's say if your partner is doing it, um, they would use one or two fingers and they'd go to about the first or second knuckle at most. And if you picture the vaginal opening like a clock, the first technique I like to share is called the horseshoe. So essentially they're going to um, internally go in and then put pressure out about like two, three o'clock, keep that pressure out and go scoop down and around in that horseshoe position. And then again, pressure out and around and doing that up for, for a few minutes. You may start with 30 seconds when you're first getting used to it. But the idea is how we talked about the flower bloom breath you're going to use that to then help you relax with that sensation. And if your partner is doing it, you do want to give them feedback in terms of if you're not feeling any kind of stretchy discomfort, then it's like, it's not really going to do anything. But if it's so much, you want to kick your partner too much pressure. So it's this in between kind of the stingy, kind of uncomfortable feeling, breathing through and over the times you do it, they should be able to put more pressure before you feel that kind of sensation. And for people know, this is not going to stretch out your pelvic floor. This is really about knowing how to connect to relax those muscles when you're doing it. Um, the second technique that I like to teach, it's like the bottom of a peace sign. When it comes to tearing, oftentimes tearing can be down here. Yes, it can be up here as well. But in terms of preparing the area, then we focus here. So the bottom of a peace sign, so you would go about four o'clock and hold for 10 seconds, six o'clock and eight o'clock. And you're just repeating that holding for about five to 10 seconds and breathing through it again. So those two techniques I find to be quite helpful for clients. Um, so you could always give that a go. And now, you know, options as well, because okay. I was the same as you, Denise, like, and I tell clients too, like, if you can't reach there at 34, 35 weeks, you're not alone. A lot of people can't, but I have some clients who are super determined and they kind of either in the bathtub because you're kind of, um, you can kind of lean back mm -hmm. or stack a bunch of pillows on your bed. So you're up, but even then sometimes you just can't reach over your baby bump. So yeah. to know there's other, other or options. around or yeah. around. Exactly. My husband yeah. did it this way. So both yep. fingers yep. in a U and I want to just tell everybody that yes, it was definitely uncomfortable. I think we mm -hmm. probably did it every other day, definitely yeah. uncomfortable. Um, but as time went on, he could tell, oh, I have much more, um, what's the word? Like I had a reduced sensation to it. I was used to it. Yeah. I knew how to breathe through it. I'm yeah. like, yes, if this is, I guess, simulating the ring of fire, right? Mm -hmm. How it's going to feel. And then I started, you know, learning how to breathe and relax the pelvic floor and just, okay, I know how to deal with this sensation. That's not very comfortable at all. Yeah. I'm ready for this. So I'm glad you, sh you showed that because, mm -hmm. you know, eight years ago, it was, here's a little handout on yeah. a paper. Oh, really? Okay. I'm supposed to do that by totally. myself. So, um, totally. definitely, definitely helpful. Yeah. However, I do want to also point out that, um, it's, not 100% going to uh, decrease episiotomy or tearing. I did have a small tear mm -hmm. with my first baby, my second mm -hmm. baby. I didn't, and I didn't do as much uh, perineal massage. So mm -hmm. go figure. <laughs> yeah, totally. And that's what I always tell people. It's like, it just, it doesn't guarantee. Um, but, it, but it's also a find, which they of course have not researched is the mental prep. Cause I have some clients who, with their first baby, they had a fourth degree tear or they had an episiotomy and they had worked on all the, the tissue in that. So it wasn't an issue in terms of the flexibility, but it was almost a mental thing that the perineal massage helped them 
for them to feel themselves or their partner to feel like, yes, I can relax into the sensation. And yes, this tissue is okay. So it can be reaffirming that way for people who've had an experience previously um, with tearings or episiotomies going into another birth. Right. And at mm -hmm. what week did you say you start this? Yeah, typically 34, 35 weeks um, is, is pretty much the, the norm with it. Right. And yeah. what kind of oil can you use for yeah. or lubricant for this? Yeah, it's a great question. So I tell people it's really individual. So I often find people at this point in pregnancy have a lot of natural lubricant going on. So I tell people like sometimes you may find you don't even want to add anything. Um, so to know that's always an option. Um, some people use other types of oils. Uh, when it comes to coconut oil, there is like this idea around it that it could affect the pH internally. So it is one of those things, it could be better to use more of a natural or like a lubricant. Sliquid is a great one in general that I often will recommend. So you could actually use that during the massage as well. If you feel like you need more lubrication in the area. Right. Great. Mm -hmm. So how do you prepare mentally to deliver a baby? And, you know, we talked about the flower bloom breath and mm -hmm. You know, while I was preparing for my baby and, and ha having my midwives and my um, hypnobirthing class, uh, you know, I talked to my other friends who are like, yeah, I'm just going to show up at the hospital and I'll just do what the doctor says. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. how else can we prepare mentally uh, for birthing our babies? Yeah, such a good question, Denise. And I think, again, it's not something people think about because birth seems like such this physical event. Mm -hmm. But as now you've gone through it, it's like some people would say it's probably more of a mental than physical or at least even. Mm -hmm. um, so it is great to, to mentally prep. So one of the things I always talk to people about is you want to find something or, or options. So that's going to keep you in the zone. For example, you mentioned you did hypnobirthing, right? And within hypnobirthing, there are so many different techniques. Um, for me personally, and for a lot of my clients, what I find works well is listening to meditation or affirmation tracks. There are ones from hypnobirthing. You can find ones on YouTube. I have one in my bump to birth method course. Um, and I would just listen to it going to sleep every night, probably about 20 weeks on. And then when I got into labor, I would turn it on and it brought me right back to that deep state of relaxation. So that's kind of the purpose around that type of um, mental prep method. Right. And it, it's a very, I would say a passive way to do it. Like it didn't take a lot of thought in terms of doing it, but it's just that repetitiveness of hearing that particular audio track in that deep state of relaxation, you'll fall asleep. You won't hear the end of them. I don't know if you ever found that too. Like you don't hear the end until yeah, you're and in that's labor. Why I thought I was doing it wrong. I, I yeah. every day I would get on uh, the, the commuter train and I would fall asleep. I'm like, I think I'm doing it wrong. I'm always falling asleep. Am I supposed yeah. to understand what they're saying? Like, and they're like, no, this is exactly yeah. what's supposed to happen. Totally. It just goes into your subconscious. So I'm glad you brought that up because I've had people bring that up in the course as well. And they're just like, every time I listen to this, I'm falling asleep. Like, is it going to work? I'm like, actually, that's fantastic. Um, so that's one way to mentally prep. Um, if that's not your thing, um, then also music. So finding different types of music have soundtracks to it. And I have some clients who will then listen throughout pregnancy. So they make like a labor playlist. I did it as well. In my first birth, I went between my meditation track and music playlist and toggled back and forth. My second, I just listened to the meditation. That's all I wanted, but prep with music. So some people will have a bath in pregnancy and that's their time. They'll put their music on because they're again in that deep state of relaxation. When you're in the bath, you're just kind of, you're chilling out. So great time to do that. So when you listen again in labor, it'll take you back there. Right. Um, other people want silence. So for some people, it's like, make sure you have earplugs in your bag before you go or wherever you're planning to give birth. You don't know what sounds you're going to hear, especially in a hospital or a birth center. Your or, um, earplugs are going to block that out. Um, another thing is the breathing. So we've done the flower bloom breath. Um, something that's going to keep you in the zone that's repetitive. I also talk about this idea of this elongated breathing. So practicing inhaling as long as you can, 
exhaling as long as you can. And then I'll have clients practice that like for about two minutes every night before you go to sleep. By the time you get to labor, you will be very surprised how long you can do that. And that really helps because contractions, they look like waves or like a mountain, right? They increase, they peak and they come down and that'll vary depending where you are in labor. But you can see how if you practice that inhale as long as you can exhale, regardless of where you are, if you can tune into that breath, um, which partners, that is a a key thing for them, they might need to remind you, that's going to keep you grounded versus if you start to get into those longer contractions and you don't have anything to mentally keep you in it, Mm -hmm. you're going to start to breathe very up here. And it's harder to cope and harder to feel like you're riding the wave of the contraction versus feeling like it's kind of taking over you and you have no control. So those are a few kind of um, strategies or practices, but also the other side is listening to different types of birth stories. So you're educated on how birth can go, options during birth, what interventions happen. Some people are surprised forceps and vacuum are still used. They definitely are. Um, And there can be a place for them. But knowing, again, questions from there to ask your care provider, like how routinely are certain things done? Mm -hmm. Um, So just learning, hearing different stories is going to then open a whole side of things for you to be able to ask questions so you're prepared for all of the situations and options um so i'd say those are a few of the key there's quite a few ways to mentally prepare but those are some key ones that i find a lot of people feel are helpful to get started right right okay so Mm -hmm. if we're practicing the flower bloom breath and Mm -hmm. we're told to push we can still push while visualizing and exhaling mm-hmm. and keeping that pelvic floor open, right? Totally. So like the push yep. kind of comes from the diaphragm. Is that mm-hmm. right? Totally. So it's great. So what I'll often exactly how you talked about this inhale, think of the flower bloom, exhale, letting some air out versus feeling like you have to hold for 10 seconds. So let some air out, but you can still direct the air down towards. So the cue I often will um, work with people on is the perineum. So if you're doing perineal massage, you could do a couple of like practice pushes at the end Mm -hmm. where you or your partner put your thumb here. You do exactly what you just said, Denise. Inhale, flower bloom, exhale, send the air down here. And you're either looking for this area to almost bulge a little bit or at least stay where it is, like stay relaxed. What you're noticing is, is it drawing in? Because that's not what we want with pushing. So it can take a bit of practice. So don't get frustrated if you try it today and you're like, ah, it's it's drawing in. Takes practice. But it's for you to get that idea that I find having this area in mind, especially with an epidural, when you really can't feel necessarily, depends how how heavy it takes. Um, but that visual I find helpful versus sometimes people are told like push, like you're really constipated. And so they're straining back here. And as we know, we don't necessarily want to push like that when we're constipated anyways, but that is a whole other story. Um, (laughs) but when people are straining back here, it's not necessarily efficient for pushing the baby out that is coming out up here. So I find getting more of that visual, the flower bloom, but also that visual further up could make it feel more effective with pushing. Right. So preparing to learn how to push, Mm -hmm. whether you have an episiotomy or not, because if you do have an episiotomy, okay, I still know how to do this, even though Mm -hmm. I can't feel what's going on down there. I can still- Oh, do you mean epidural? Epidural. Sorry, epidural is what I meant. Yes, epidural. I was like, I was thinking, yeah, okay. So yes, if you have an epidural and you can't really feel what's going on down there, at least you practice and you know how to do Mm -hmm. and let go. Yeah, totally. Um, Okay, what do I have next here? Okay, so I want to just point out because there's three years in between my two children. So Mm -hmm. first child did the hypnobirthing, did the course, did all that. And so the second child, I'm like, yeah, I know what to do. We did a little bit of uh, perineal massage but maybe i wasn't as prepared maybe it's just because it was a boy but things were a lot slower um and you know they were telling me to push and in my brain i'm like no i know this is not the time 
um, things just went a little different. I knew in my heart, I should have sat in a tub, but somebody told me not to do it because of whatever reason, right? So mm. I do you recommend doing mm. these your course or any other course yeah. to prepare you again for the second baby, even though you did the preparations for the first one? A hundred percent. And so I find, so this is whether people I see in clinic, but also people who join bump to birth, it's a mix. So a lot of first time moms that I see, it's like, they've heard from family or friends. They haven't obviously been through it, but they've just heard it's worth preparing. Um, but a lot of the subsequent moms I see, they're like, you know what, last time either I prepared or I had none of this knowledge and this is how birth went and I want to do things differently this time. So I'd say it's super common for um, preparing for subsequent births, almost because like you've been through one or more experiences and you're able to take from that, okay, what did I not actually feel as prepared about? What's most important to me now? And that's where it helps you choose, you know, what avenue, like what type of course or how you want to focus. Because depending on the type of course or courses you took the first time, maybe you found there was like information missing. I find traditional courses, um, pelvic floor information is often missing. And if it's included, it's usually out of date. Um, and also pushing. Pushing is the most common part. I find it's like labor, labor, labor. Okay, you're going to push the baby out. Oh, and then newborn care. And then I end up seeing them and they're just like, I felt like a deer in headlights. I had no idea what I was doing. Someone was counting to 10 in my face. I was told to hold my breath. I couldn't, I didn't know what was going on with my body. So I find pushing is another aspect that subsequent moms are just like, I just want to know more options this time around. So I feel more actively a part of the process versus it just happening to me. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think I, sh in hindsight, I should have done the course again, but you know, life is busy. You have a kid and you're like, I did it before it worked out perfectly. Yeah. yeah. It was three years ago. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The one thing that we, I mean, I felt very prepared for the first baby, but what we didn't really prepare for was how was my spouse going to help me? We had a ho two home births. And yeah. so, you know, he was there, but like, what was he supposed to do? So I had, you know, the yeah. midwives and uh, a birth doula. I'm like, how is he going to be put to work? So, you know, yeah. doula was great, but how can the spouse, the partner, the husband help uh, to prepare? And what is their job during labor and delivery? Yeah, I love it. And it's such a key question. Um, and similar to when I recommend rather than waiting till the end of pregnancy for you, the person giving birth, it's also helpful for the partner to have a bit more heads up on how they can help. So understanding, yes, how labor, like, you know, the stages of labor, labor positions, um, options, put all the pushing information is key for them. Um, because again, they may otherwise not know options at all. And I, and the thing is your partner knows you better than anyone. They like know you, but they don't necessarily know labor and birth and what may come up. Um, but also to even your preferences, I use birth preferences instead of birth plan. Um, and so them understanding what your preferences are because then they can best support you. They can advocate for you. So that's another part partner's understanding is like, they can ask questions mm -hmm. um, so that you can get the information you need to make choices or they can speak for you. Because sometimes interventions come in, like let's say, or like cervical exam or breaking the water, or we need to use this, we need to use that. And they can actually ask, you know, what are the benefits? What are the risks? What are the alternatives? Um, and then them knowing your preferences, they can actually speak for you because in active labor, you may not be in the headspace to ask questions or answer questions. So your partner being on the same page and understanding what to ask and what your preferences are can actually make a massive difference mm -hmm. in your experience. And then also knowing strategies to support you but there's two sides to this. Some people only learn hands-on strategies, which are great. Sacral pressure, double hip squeeze. These are great. But sometimes what happens is we're in labor. I don't know if you had this experience, Denise, but some people do not want to be touched. 
like they just don't don't even come in my bubble like support me from afar and then some partners feel really lost or like well I learned all these hands-on things and she doesn't want me to touch her so how how am I going to support her so that is really key I go over in clients and in bump to birth of all these other ways you can support um, from afar, but also help with progress, whether it's, you know, keeping you hydrated, reminding you to go pee, um, changing position, all these things they can kind of do from a distance, but can make a massive difference in your experience. So those I'd say would be really the key things for them to understand. So it's more than probably what they think. Bring during those hard times, the contractions, yeah. um, my, uh, husband, he was told to look into my eyes and just look, you know, look into my eyes and for yeah. me to focus and for him to say, I don't even know what he said, but he said some like affirming things. And so yeah. that's, <laughs> that was part of his job. So that yeah. was good. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, and what's interesting, right. So if for whatever, during your late, some people like to be with their eyes closed. So then him having in hypnobirthing, like there's so many other strategies they teach too, that even, you know, hearing those words can make a difference for you too, even if you weren't able to lock eyes. Right. So that's a great example of like having ways to support you that aren't always in those traditional courses, which might give a couple of hands-on strategies, but not like the bigger picture of what can help. Right. What about tools? I... Mm-hmm. For some reason, I don't know where this came from, but I had to have like, you know, those little squishy balls. So I had a squishy yep. ball and I was using that puppy and that worked for me. What are yes. some other tools that uh, you recommend? Yeah, that can be helpful. So one I find is a bed sheet. So whether hospital or if you're at home or a birth center, there should always be a bed sheet available for things, for example, like the double hip squeeze. So if you, if that is your thing and a double hip squeeze is basically your partner pressing or your doula pressing inward this way at different spots around your pelvis, if that is your go-to and that can be uh, like during a contraction, then hands off. If you're wanting that repeatedly for a big part of your labor, that gets really tiring. So for your partner, but I mean, you're going through labor. So like they can deal with it, but to make, (laughs) to make it so that they can continue doing it, Things like using a bed sheet around, there's a way you can bring it around the hips under the belly so that they end up pulling. So they're using different muscles to give the pushing muscles a break. So Mm -hmm. things I find bed sheet um, is a great one to have too. And even how you might like to squishy ball for you, but also even um, some people really like tennis balls and that, that they can actually press against the wall. So oftentimes pressure in this area can feel really relieving during labor. So again, their partner could press, but also as the person laboring, you may want to have tennis balls here and you actually push against the wall, which creates a similar pressure. So those are common ones, but also um, birth ball, peanut ball, Um, if you follow me on Instagram, you've probably heard me talk about the peanut ball, like a million times. It is a fantastic tool to have, um, a lot more facilities have them now. Um, so they can be great. And again, your partner knowing birth ball positions and peanut ball positions. So you're not thinking, oh, what position am I going, going to next? Because that's often not where our brain goes, but your partner could help you change positions. Right. So those I'd say would be kind of the main tools. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's really good. That's why it's important that it's not just you doing these courses. It's also your partner because yeah. you're not going to be thinking of all those positions that you had practiced. Your, yeah. <laughs> your partners are be like, I remember this one. You like this one. Go ahead and do it. Yeah. Totally. Awesome. Thank you. Can you tell us about your bump to birth uh, course and method yeah. that you have? Yeah, totally. So I created the bump to birth method. It's an online program. You do it from the comfort at your home at your own pace. And really it's around giving you guidance to have less pain and pelvic floor symptoms in pregnancy, um, mentally and physically prepare for labor and pushing, including minimizing tearing. Also key strategies for your partner to support you during birth and how to navigate your postpartum recovery. So it really goes through pregnancy, birth, and postpartum recovery. I really felt strongly it needed to include all of those pieces because there's often um, 
with a lot of prenatal courses, it's just birth Mm -hmm. and there's so much more to it that you can get value from. So that's what is in the program and it really guides you step by step. So it's um, short video and audio lessons and then also complimentary handouts that go with it. There is also a partner labor prep workshop. So all the lessons that are broken down into smaller pieces for you to watch and your partner can watch any of them too. But if you kind of want to sit down together and get so much of it that they need to know in one, in one time, it's about a 90 minute workshop and I'm teaching it to you that you can like pause it and practice things, practice labor positions, practice pushing positions. So it's so many people have gone through it, say that was really key for their partners. So they had strategies Um, they have pictures, everything. So often they'll save that in their phone. So when labor comes and something Mm -hmm. comes up and the partner's just like, okay, how do, how do I do this again? Right. So, so it really helps both of you feel prepared, but also the key things around like so many people, as you know, Denise go through, um, you know, leaking pee, different types of pain, prolapse symptoms within pregnancy. So I wanted to make sure there were lessons on all the common pelvic floor and pain issues that come up in pregnancy. And then you have a lot of key strategies um, that I share with clients in kind of a general way that you can then use at home. Awesome. Thank you. And I'm going to put the, the, um, the link down to your course and do you also have a freebie? I believe it's your discovering. Can you tell us about that? Yes. So in this, so it's a free, um, guide and it walks you through in terms of, you know, discovering how to connect with your pelvic floor in pregnancy. So it walks you through that core canister breath, the flower bloom breath and how to use that within pregnancy. So it's a nice kind of easy, quick way um, to review some of the stuff we talked about and also have it in written form. So you can definitely grab that as well. Awesome. So you guys can get that down below. Anita, thank you so much uh, for joining us and answering my questions. And I will have your Instagram, your website, all the details in the description box below for the moms who are watching. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Denise. Yeah. You're welcome.